Welcome to Reflections, a show that seeks to examine if others see God in your reflection and how scripture relates to us in this day and age. Peace and all God's blessings be with you. I am Father Bob Janine, the pastor of Mission St. Sergius in Bacchus, an all-inclusive, affirming, welcoming faith community of the Reformed Catholic Church. I am also the Servant General of the Order Franciscans of Mercy. Today, we are going to be reflecting on the readings for the first Sunday of Lent. And I have entitled my homily, God's Promises in the Rainbow. Our reading is from Genesis, and it tells of God's promise to Noah and his sons after the great flood that there would never, ever be another flood that would devastate the whole earth. God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. So, we can assume from that that the earth is not going to certainly end in a massive flood. The rainbow has come to symbolize many, many things over time. It is the symbol that we see in the heavens after a storm, when the sun's rays go through the particles of moisture in the air and they create a beautiful arced rainbow. And that symbol has been taken up and used as a positive message. With the rainbow nation, it represents the diverse ethnic groups that make up this world. Within the GLBTQI 2S community, it symbolizes the diversity of God's children regarding sexual orientation. God's promise of I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. All of the earth, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and I will remember the everlasting covenant that I have made between all creatures. So, that's something that we look forward to. Lent is a time of reflection, a time of preparing ourselves, a time of looking forward to traveling along the Via Dolorosa, the road of sorrows with Christ, recalling what he was willing to do for us. Whatever is knowledge, if one does not have fear of God, it is better to be a humble countryman that serves God than the proud philosopher who considers the course of the heavens and neglects himself before God. Judge not, 
lest you be judged. All too often in these, this society of ours, we have the tendency to feel superior for one reason or another. Some people think that they're better than others because of the color of their skin. Some feel they're better than others because of their religious denomination. Some feel that they're better than others because of their wealth or their fame or their power. Some people interpret the Bible one way and others another according to their own personal agendas and not necessarily in accord with what the Bible actually says. In Book One of The Following of Christ, Thomas A. Kempis tells us, high words make not a man holy and righteous, but a virtuous life makes him dear to God. If you knew the whole Bible and all the sayings of all the philosophers, for what does it avail you without love and the grace of God? And the next line, oh, the next line is the gem. The next line is the gem. Vanities, oh, vanities, all is vanity save only loving God and serving Him alone. That's what we need to remember. Not only during the Lenten season, but every day of our lives. It does not matter. God doesn't care how much money you have. God doesn't care how powerful you are. God doesn't care whether you're a superstar. In fact, I believe personally, just the opposite. The poorer a person is, the more humble a person is, the more God loves them. So, how do we best serve God? How can we best serve God? And I know of only one pretty good answer. By living the Beatitudes every single day of our life. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the hungry, the poor in spirit. God created everything. God created us in His own image and likeness. And God wants us to attain everlasting life. All people are created with their sexual orientation. And that in and of itself is not a bad thing. The bad comes in when we, like in all things, when we do not use the gifts that God gives us in the manner in which they were meant to be used. Moderation in all things is a good thing. 
If you want to lose weight, you don't have to starve yourself. You don't have to deprive yourself. Just be moderate. Have a little of everything. And the same is true in all of our lives. We need to live moderately. We need to take and use the gifts that God gives us, first of all, in the manner in which they were meant to be used, and secondly, without excess. Excess doesn't do any good for anybody. It actually can make one very, very sick. Our society today is a society that seems to want more and more and more and more of everything. They want the bigger, bigger house. Oh, I, I know, there is this new movement going on for small houses, tiny houses, as they call them. And I look at some of them and I think, you know, I don't know, I might be able to live like that. That looks good. That looks interesting. When I see all these mega mansions, though, I lo think, why do you need all that room? If you're a family of three or four, why do you need five bedrooms, four and a half baths? Why do you need this? And, and, and again, who's going to keep it clean? It's a lot of work. All I need is what I need. The moderate way to go. We need to respect one another. That's another thing that's very, very important. We need to respect one another and respect the diversity that God created in this world. He didn't just go about and just decide. Everything that God did has a purpose. Much of what he's created, we still haven't found the purpose of. There is a purpose, and yes, Science periodically makes a great big breakthrough. They discover, oh, there's something in jellyfish that's good for the human mind. And there's this plant does this and that plant does that. Wow, look at this. God gave us everything we would need. Everything that we would need. And he asks us to respect it. We haven't done a good job of that. What we are called to do is feed the hungry, be peacemakers, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, ransom the captive, bury the dead. That's what we were told we were to do. Christ told us that. Are we doing all those things? That's something that we need to ask ourselves during this Lenten season. Sin came into the world because people did not listen or follow God's will. 
Adam and Eve were brought into this beautiful, beautiful place. And they were told, you can partake of everything in this garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of it. Satan, who was at war with God, got thrown out of heaven because he challenged God, thought he was more powerful and greater than God. Satan enticed Eve. Now, the sin was not the eating of the apple. The sin was disobedience. To God. Disobedience of God's will. God was tempting Eve and Adam for one purpose, to have them turn away from God. Last week, a few weeks ago, we had the readings from the book of Job, where Satan said, Ah, oh, yeah, it's easy for God, Job to love you, God. Look at all he's got, everything in the world he's got. And God said, Well, you can take it all away and see whether or not you're true. See whether or not that's fact. So Satan went about systematically taking everything that Job had away from him. And yes, Job got very down and very depressed, but the thing was he never lost his faith in God. And ultimately, God rewarded Job and gave him back 10 times everything he had. Satan is continuously tempting us. He's using every single trick in the book to try to have us lose faith in God, to turn away from God. He tempts us with money, power, fame, fortune, all kinds of things in order to turn us away for us to worship those things, consider them more important than God. The corporal works of mercy are the guideline. Feed the hungry. You don't have to go too far in any city or town within this country and certainly around the world, to find people who are hungry. Share what you have with them. Give drink to the thirsty. That's, again, something. There are people who do not have clean drinking water. Clothe the naked. There are people out there in the cold who do not have enough clothing to keep themselves warm, and they end up dying because they catch pneumonia. Our community has periodically gone and gotten clothes and gone out into the streets and gave them to the poor, the homeless who were there inadequately clothed. Shelter the homeless. Now that's a very big one. Think about this. There are people who have tried to escape their countries because of oppression, war, poverty, and come to this country for a better life. And they need 
to be sheltered, to be welcomed. And welcome the stranger is an ancient rule of God's. Yet our government is trying to crack down on cities and towns that are sheltering immigrants. And you know what? I worked in California for so many years in parishes. And many of our parishes, in fact, my last parish that I was assigned to and worked in was 90% Hispanic. You could not find a more devout, pious, hard-working group of people. They did jobs that nobody else wanted to do. They worked for wages, the barest of minimum wages, just so they could try to build and have a better life. And as a teacher in the school of the parish, they also paid out of their hard-earned labor to make sure that their children got a good, strong education, both in the basics, reading, writing, literature, math, science, but also in their faith. Our churches were filled. We didn't have one mass on a Sunday, or two, or three, or four. Many times we had masses on Saturday evening, and I said masses, plural, and many masses on Sunday, beginning as early as 7, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and continuing all the way until 2 in the afternoon. And the churches were filled and sometimes overflowing. And these were the people that our government right now, many of them, our government wants to throw out of this country. My question to our government might be, who's going to do the jobs that these people are doing? They're doing jobs that most Americans look down upon, don't want to do. So who's going to do that? Who's going to go out and spend a whole day in the fields picking the produce? Who's going to clean the toilets? These are the type of jobs that these people were willing to do. Ancient law of God calls us to welcome the immigrant, to shelter the homeless, to care for them, ransom the captive, bury the dead. This is what we are called to do. During this season of Lent, we need to ask ourselves how well we are doing this. Are we oppressing other people? Are we being bigoted, narrow-minded? Are we filled with jealousy and hatred? If we are, we need to overcome those things. Satan is constantly going to be after us to have us lose our faith. And the closer we are to God, the greater and the stronger the temptations become. As I said, he uses power, fame, wealth. The same, actually, the very same things he tempted Jesus Christ with. Now, think of this. If Satan is willing to tempt the Son of God, what makes us think he's not tempting us every day? 
Pope Francis, in his first homily on the Lenten season, had this to say. What does this invitation to poverty, a life of evangelical poverty, mean to us today? First of all, it shows us how God works. He does not reveal himself cloaked in worldly power and wealth, but rather in weakness and poverty. Though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. Christ, the eternal Son of God, one with the Father in power and glory, chose to be poor. He came amongst us and drew near to each of us. He set aside his glory and emptied himself so that he could be like us in all things. By making himself poor, Jesus did not seek poverty for his own sake, but that by his poverty you might become rich. This is no more play on words or a catchphrase. Rather, it sums up God's logic, the logic of love, the logic of the incarnation and the cross. Christ's love is different. When Jesus stepped onto the waters of the Jordan and was baptized by John, he did so not because he was in need of repentance or conversion, he did it to be among people who need forgiveness, to be among us sinners, and to take upon himself the burden of